everyone. Thanks for downloading the Garden Fork Radio podcast. This is the eclectic DIY uh, podcast that I do with my friends. It's the companion to the Garden Fork YouTube channel. And today I have my good friend Rick. Hey, man. Hey, good morning, Eric. How are you, my friend? I'm having, you're going to all have to listen to this, is that my neighbor is renovating their kitchen and their bathroom and they're jackhammering the common brick wall. So uh, if you hear a hammer in the background, a jackhammer, it's just part of the ambience, the ambiance of the DIY ethic of Garden Fork. That's right. Your your neighbors are doing a good job. I can't imagine jackhammering a wall. <laughs> actually, jackhammers are, they're like these mid-size electric ones that plug into the wall. And I used, I've used one twice, actually. There in some, there's a sump pump video we used one in and we put right. a backyard drain in. And they work really well at breaking up cement when you got to go through like a, a basement floor or a sidewalk or something. They're great. You know, um, a neighbor of mine was breaking a, um, a piece of cement with a, a um, sledgehammer and he couldn't make any headway. Well, do you hear a um, button back there whining? Yeah, that's part um, of the ambiance. Jackhammers, part, dogs. Yeah. And uh, I went and got him a, um, a one of those electric plug-in ones, rented it for him. And we finished that project in no time at all. Yeah, I mean, it'll take you longer to rent the jackhammer than it will to use it. That's probably true. And uh, a couple of the, the Orange store has rentals I know of. I'm all about, you know, renting from your local store. But make sure it works before you take it out. Um, I went to one rental place and I bought, uh, I rented a cast iron pipe cutter a couple of years ago. And it was broke. I got it to the job and it was broke. And so I, I lost basically a whole day dealing with a broken tool. And I brought it back and they could kind of, oh, yeah, that one's broken. I'm like, oh, well, you know. Well, why did you loan it to me? <laughs> so I don't go to that rental place anymore. <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, we I posted on Facebook on the uh, uh, Garden Fork question and answer period or um, – site there Group. that um you know we were having trouble because of a jackhammer and i said you know if anything's going on um uh, you know if you'd like for us to talk about be sure and uh in post maybe we can get some up there and of course uh garden fork scientist tony uh says he's heard there's um there's an election going on soon and uh, we're not going to talk about that no <laughs> uh <laughs> but then uh will wallace pointed out that uh, one the cubs won the world series which is a really big deal yeah, yeah, Monica's and, uh, very happy, I know. I know she is. But also that his wife showed up at the hospital for the birth of our second child about two hours ago, and they're probably about two to three hours away from go time. Wow, so, good uh, for them. Yeah, good for you, Will. Yeah. Good luck Good luck with that, uh, that uh, birthing for your wife. Yeah, that's one thing you can't use your backhoe for, Will. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what else is new? Um, I've been doing a lot of plumbing. I saw that. You you sent me some pictures of a commode project that looked harrowing. Yeah, actually, that's a video I, I'm going to edit later today. Um, I had to, I noticed that the toilet on the first floor was leaking, a very tiny, slow leak, because I already had the wall open because I just replaced all this cast iron PVC, which we posted a video about. I'll link in the notes here to that. And... Um, I thought, oh, I'll just replace the wax ring. And I made a video about that. And the, the fl it's called a flange. It's the, it's the adapter that takes a uh, sewer pipe, a drain pipe, usually a four inch, and has a set of bolt holes on it that will bolt into the floor of your bathroom. And there are bolts from there that will bolt into the bowl of the toilet to hold it all together. And the wax ring goes between the flange which rests on the floor of your bathroom and the toilet. And it is a, it's like, it's like a mushy wax. And it's great because it makes a very nice vapor seal and water seal. And it's right. very, it's, uh, because it is this, it's like clay wax. You can smush it around. So if your flange isn't very level or if the toilet's a bit wonky, I usually put two wax rings in because they just smush out. And I put that all in and we finished the video and I'm, and then I'm like, you know, that just doesn't feel right. It was just something mm -hmm. I knew the flange would have to be replaced at some point, but we're going to redo that bathroom in the future. And I thought, well, I'll just do it then. So I took the bolts off the toilet and I pulled the toilet off 
And by screwing the bolts onto the toilet tank, I had pulled the flange out of the floor. Oh, no. And I realized that the wood floor was rotted from the water dripping out of this leak and that it had been repaired numerous times. Mm -hmm. So I decided to replace the toilet and the flange and the pipe attached to the flange. And the floor, too, right? Or did you just reinforce it? I had to reinforce it. Well, it has tile on top of uh, backer board, which is on top of kind of plywood that might be rotting. So I just, from the, thankfully I could access it from the basement and I slid up pieces um, to reinforce that, but it took nine hours to do it. (laughs) Oh my. You know, my worst toilet uh, experience is when we redid our uh, spare bathroom and I put in nice, it was wonderful tile, um, that kind of natural rock tile. And it was really thick behind the uh, toilet and didn't think about it. And then when it came time to drop the toilet on there, I was about an inch and a half short of the um, the sewer hole, yep. the drain going out. Fortunately, a friend told me about, there's a, um, I forget what they call it, but there's a shorter version of that that's made specifically for this instance. When you, Right, there's a flange this, adapter, yeah, an ex- fl- uh, flange extension. Yeah, and so I, I got that fixed, but I, I was really worried I was going to have to chip up concrete to... Um, uh, re- reposition that uh, that uh, sewer pipe going out. They make a they make a, a a basically, it's an adapter that will slide in the the interior diameter of a four inch pipe, uh, is still actually large enough for a toilet to function properly. So it can become a three inch one. So what you do is you you have a pipe that's designed to slide in there, and it has a rubber gasket usually. And that slides in, and you can screw it in, and that gives you that raises up the flange back up to height. A lot of people don't plan for that when they put tile in. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was a mess, but I worked my way out of it. Or you could take three wax rings and load it in. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those things where it's it's done now, and um, I'm gonna go reshoot the end of the video and tell everyone how it happened because I'm kind of all about being honest in the videos. But wax rings are actually really easy to replace and they solve a lot of problems. And what I found with this one is the previous people who did any of the work uh, just put in the wax ring in a just a, a wrong way. And so it was had a slow leak in it. So there you go. Well, you, you know, done is better than perfect. Yeah, well, with the toilet, <laughs> you want it to not leak. <laughs> <laughs> because you usually can't see it leaking unless you open a wall up, you know, or yeah, the exactly. ceiling, the ceiling below starts to have water stains and then you're like, oh, so. Okay. Well, I'm glad that worked out for you. You've had a couple of recent videos. I noticed bean hole and refrigerator repair. Isn't that fun to dig a hole in the yard and cook beans? I've never thought about doing that. So I, I, um, I guess I'll have to experiment with it. From what I understand from the, the research that I did, it, um, it's most famous for logging camps in New England, uh, where the cook would paddle down river ahead of the loggers that were bringing stuff down the river, and he would dig a hole, start a fire, and put a, a pot of beans in there, and then bury it, and then the loggers would come down and dig out the pot of beans and have beans to eat the next day. Oh, amazing. And it's all you got to do is just, I dug a hole in my, one of my raised beds. Yeah. That looked, that looked really easy. Yeah. Yeah. That way you don't have to dig into the hard earth. And I just used clay brick. You don't have to use fire brick. Right. I, and of course the New York times had an article and these chefy chef guys in their weekend homes had built these bean holes that were with fire brick and all, you know, it was all manicured. I'm like, you know, (laughs) just didn't have to be just don't use river rock. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I got to use my flamethrower. It, it explode. I noticed that, you know, I thought about putting a uh, kind of like uh, adapting for a, a rocket stove and putting a, a, a vent tube in low into the fire pit from the side to uh, get a little more oxygen in there so that it would, it would circulate better. You could. You could totally mm-hmm. do that. I just thought it was something to like go out in the yard and, you know, get your kids, get, let your kids dig a hole and play with fire. Yeah. <laughs> You've been big on that lately. Uh, we're going to talk about your pyromaniac uh, <laughs> uh, proclivities. Yeah, and then um, my 
refrigerator has been frosting up the coils that the coils that cool that freeze the freezer and cool the fridge in most refrigerators are in the freezer behind a, a metal plate or plastic plate that has little slots cut in it and a fan attached to it. And I noticed that there was frost coming out of the little vents in the freezer and that the fridge was getting too warm. And so I popped the back panel off and this thing was frozen solid. So I'd, I'd hit it with the blow dryer to melt it all down. And there's a drain bob, by the way, in the back of your freezer. And then there's a tray at the bottom of your fridge underneath the fridge where that water will evaporate. Um, and there's a fan to, uh, usually a fan to blow air over the water to keep it uh, evaporating. Yeah. And I finally, I did some research and there's there's this old school heating and cooling guy who has a, like a, a site that was built with HTML1. You know, it's all text <laughs> and some JPEGs. Yeah. And he's like, he step-by-step step walks you through diagnosing what's wrong with your fridge. And he said, there's this thing called the defrost timer. And I didn't realize this, but your freezer, when it's self defrosts, there's a heating rod under the coil, the, the freezer coil, and it heats up the whole coil every X number of hours or X number of times the door is opened. Um, it depends on how smart and wired your uh, fridge, or, fridge or freezer is. But this, it looks... It functions just like a analog light timer that you plug into the wall and it makes all that clicking noise, you know, click, click, yeah, click, I, click, Yeah, I was surprised, yeah. It's very, very Luddite. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the part was all a six bucks. And the secondary problem can be a thermostat, which is uh, attached to the freezer coil. And that was like four bucks. So I bought both of them, both parts. Because sure. the shipping is more than the parts. And then I replaced the timer... And I had the thermostat just in case it wasn't the timer. But the, the guy on his website said 98% of the time, it's the timer that causes this problem. And sure enough, um, I don't have to defrost my freezer by hand anymore. Wow. You know, I was just kind of blown away. I had no idea. You know, that's like a, a literally a black box to me. You know, as soon as the refrigerator starts acting up, I just have to call the repairman. But I, I didn't even know there was something that simple that you could repair in a, in a refrigerator. Yeah, and the thermostat is even easier because the thermostat is just you just cut the old one out and crimp the new one in, and boom, you're done. It, what The devil about refrigerator freezes is if there's an issue with the compressor or the uh, refrigerant, but the compressors are self-contained, and I think once the compressor dies, you you might as well just swap out your refrigerator. Yeah, we did that just recently, and... You know, there are some really sexy um, refrigerators out there. I, I was uh, I was tempted by that uh, five-door Samsung two-compressor refrigerator where one of the doors it, you can be converted from, um, or one of the compartments with the door can be converted from uh, refrigeration to freezing and back again. And I, I, I was, I really thought about it hard and I said, you know, no, that's, that's going to be a little too complicated. Uh, it's just more, more stuff to break. Yeah, exactly. The more, and I said, you know, all we do is open the door and you know get stuff out. As long as it keeps stuff cold and and freezes down the bottom, we have a bottom freezer. Then uh, that's really all we care about. I see a lot of ice makers break, and um, it just seems like water and motors and frozen water don't work too well together. You know? Yeah. Yeah, we have an ice maker, but we avoided all the through the door stuff. You know, water and ice, and and some of them have. Uh, uh, dispensers for uh, other kind of drinks like orange juice or something. And we said, no, we don't want any of that. Just a, a good old simple uh, refrigerator. And of course I went to consumers report and, uh, and got the ones they recommended because uh, I don't have time to become a refrigeration expert. We, uh, when we bought our little country house, there was a, a fridge in there and I looked at that and I said, that's going to die in six months. And uh, 14 years later, it's still running. <laughs> <laughs> you know we had an old frigidaire when i was growing up that lasted i think 30 something years yeah and now um like water heaters like your basement uh tank water heater they're the warranty is 10 years and they were literally they will last 10 years in a day right um one of the things i found out uh i uh, bought a, a high efficiency water heater because i wanted it to 
you know, it, it's in the garage. And so it kind of needs to be self-contained, well insulated and everything. And they said, do you want a, um, a, um, extra warranty, extend the warranty on that. And I said, well, what would I get different? And they said, well, we just extend the warranty. It's the same machine. It's the same water heater. Uh, we just charge you more so we can pay for it if it breaks. And I thought, no, I'll, I'll take my chances. Yeah. I, um, I like when people, I look at houses for people, uh, before they're going to buy them. And I just, you can, there's a date on the water heater actually, and you can just tell them when it's going to break. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of appliances, uh, yes. there was an incident, and then today there's an article in the New York Times related to that, but uh, I, as we all know, I have an aversion to smart uh, little appliances in the home. Uh, we have some viewer mail, actually, to talk about that, but um, oh, really? part, part of the internet was shut off by um, thermostats. <laughs> and refrigerators and smart... Um... You know, all these little doodads in your house that are smart and are absolutely unprotected in a security sense from um, being exploited. Yeah. So all of your I've actually, you know, like I would love to have a wireless thermostat, but I won't get one because of this very thing. You uh, whenever you connect your thermostat or your TV or whatever to your Wi-Fi, it. Unless it has really robust protections, and a lot of them don't, it's kind of wide open to the internet. And somebody used all these devices to plant, to create a bot network that overwhelmed what's called a name server uh, that is controls part of the East Coast, from what I understand. So instead of attacking an individual site, it did a uh, denial of service attack, I think it's called. Distributed it, denial of service. Right. So there's a bunch yeah. of devices, a bunch of little mini computers asking for the same information from one place. And they attacked a domain name server this time, which is like a file cabinet that lines up IP numbers with uh, names like Amazon or Etsy or eBay. So like Amazon has an IP address. It's like 199.164.135. And... The internet does works with numbers and we work with words. So when we type in Amazon, the name servers convert that to numbers and point your computer at the right place to go to Amazon or Etsy or whatever. And by attacking that server with all these requests, it bogged it down and shut it down. <laughs> you know, I know that happened because uh, we were trying to watch a, a movie on Netflix and Netflix was hit hard by that uh, by that same uh, denial of service attack. Yeah, I thought it was like my cable connection, and I'm complaining about the cable company, you know? I did, too. I rebooted my uh, wireless network at home and, and all that stuff, and then, then I got to reading on the Internet, and I said, ah, of course, that's the reason I can't get in. So the New York Times has an article today about an Israeli security company found a flaw in some smart light bulbs. There are these light bulb systems where you can have a bunch of LED bulbs and they're controlled by a smartphone app. And they were able to be within 230 feet of a building and they could take control of the light bulbs in the building. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's like, okay, well, big deal. We'll turn my light off, you know? No, but it could be a, as a point of harassment, you know, the blinking, flashing bulbs or, but it just kind of opens the door to, it could also be your security TV your cameras that are you got placed around the house or around the perimeter, and all of a sudden they switch them on and can uh, start recording or watching what you're doing. Yeah, so I, I mean, I love technology. Um, I would love to have an Alexa in the house, but there's part of me that's like, well, what if somebody turns that thing on when I don't want it on, you know? You know, I had um, for a long time been kind of a, an advocate of uh, radical openness. I just, you know, I use my name as my email address, um, you know, rhkennerly at gmail.com. Um, it's on my website. It's, you know, and I just have really worked at being open. And recently I've just decided it's not worth the trouble. And so, you know, I have really contracted back and, um, you know, put my uh, uh, Wi-Fi or my network here at the house behind a, uh, a virtual private network, VPN which encrypts everything that leaves here. Uh, all my devices connect to the Wi-Fi using VPN. I use a uh, ghostery. I use, uh, which is, um, it it's controls. Yeah. It's a plugin for a uh, Chrome. I don't know if it's for any other. It's uh, for Firefox too. Is it? And it, um, 
make sure that uh, no one's recording your cookies and, and your locations and what you're shopping for, that kind of thing. I use um, uh, HTPS Everywhere, I think it's called. It's by the Electronic Frontier Foundation to make sure I always have an HTTPS uh, S for secure connection so that it's encrypted that way. And then I also... Um, uh, let me see. What was it? I was going to say, I forget now. But anyway, there, I just, I've really worked. Oh, I use DuckDuckGo for my search engine. Yeah, I use that uh, too. If you don't, yeah. If you don't know about DuckDuckGo, it's like Bing or it's like Google, but it doesn't record your searches. It relates nothing to you. And that helps in two ways. One, nobody can, you know, check on what you're uh, searching for and begin, but then no one can begin sending you filtered information that relates to previous searches. And so you get in that echo chamber where, you know, you're always seeing the same things and the same kinds of people because you all have things in common and things um, of, of common interest. And so they just stop doing that. And all of a sudden I've stopped seeing all the ads for things that I searched for on Amazon, um, you know, three months ago that are still popping up on the regular Google um, uh, kind of searches. I get a lot of spam for tactical flashlights. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, yeah, you're just that kind of guy, you know. I don't, maybe because I looked up the deer hunting uh, season this year, you know. It, it could be. Um, yeah, some of those things that you know they have smoke coming out of them and and whatnot, and you're going, well, I don't think flashlights are supposed to smoke, you know. <laughs> but it, anyway, yeah, it's it's. Uh, and then I also use a um, uh, use Sophos S O. PHOS software, which they have free software for individuals and families uh, that really does a great job of, uh, of protecting the, uh, the equipment here at the house. And it's for every platform. What's that called? And it's Sophos, S-O-P-H-O-S. S-O-P-H-O-S. And they also have a killer um, uh, podcast about security. And I have learned so much about um, internet security when since I've been listening to their soft, their uh, Sophist podcast. All right, cool. So, and then they, if you have a spare computer, they also have free software for what they call an internet appliance. It will uh, reformat and put their software on your computer. You put your computer between your router and the um, and the internet, and it will give you a. Um, a private VPN that you can use anytime you're on the internet and also uh, keep all malicious software and, and um, uh, even stuff that comes in as, as, as um, attachments that has uh, uh, bugs in it. Uh, it will uh, intercept that and clean it out, strip it out before you uh, receive it. Wow. I do have a spare computer. So I'll have to look at that. Yeah. Look at it. It's, it's uh, you know, you really can't be too careful anymore. Because uh, you know, people get in there and they they can brick your computer. The uh, the the ransomware business is just uh, phenomenally destructive and very profitable, apparently. Especially if you have uh, an AOL address, they can nail you. Yeah, but if you don't know about ransomware, it's um, you open a link, it installs something on your computer. Usually, it's done accidentally or it's something that comes from a friend, and it encrypts your hard drive and then. You have to go buy bitcoins to get the um, code to decrypt your hard drive, and if you don't do it, your hard drive stays encrypted forever. And once that's happened, you might as well just take it out and hit it with a hammer because it's you'll you'll never get back in. And so it's a, a particularly pernicious kind of uh, attack that is very lucrative. Um, I think the average is around three or four hundred dollars to unlock your hard drive in what bitcoin. If, what if you if Will it also lock up your backup drive that's attached? It depends if you've uh, uh, backed up and re and kept that um, that file. You know, if, if you back up and you back up the file that just came in that locks your hard drive, then the next time you run your backup and, and reinstall, it will uh, once again reactivate that, uh, oh, I see. that software and re-encrypt your hard drive. All right. Well, so let's bummer. go on a lighter note now. We have some viewer mail. Okay. Let's hear it for the viewers. We heard from Kevin, who we always hear from, which I love. He goes, "We I was talking about different batteries for uh, flashlights and things. 
And, oh, this is a little black dog, Kevin. And and uh, Kevin says, I use specific batteries. Uh, I use the EverReady Lithiums for stuff that's going to sit around like flashlights in my car or the emergency flashlight by the fuse box. Lithium AA batteries have a 10-year shelf life and more power than other types. And I can attest to that because in my weather station, which is up on the roof of my garage, I put lithium batteries because you don't want to climb up there and replace them a lot. Yeah, yeah. Then I use the Sanyo Eneloop batteries. Uh, they're like, they might be called Panasonic batteries now for everything else. They're rechargeable batteries that act like an alkaline battery. They hold over 90% of their charge for a year. If you do a show on emergency preparedness, I'd like to hear, I'd like a comparison of the emergency food packages. Love the show. So yeah, I actually have some of the Eneloop batteries and they're highly rated by a number of sites. So um, they work really well and you can buy them well, you can buy them through the Garden Fork TV Amazon affiliate link, which is gardenfork.tv slash Amazon. Okay. How's that for which, a plug? Uh, yeah, which, yeah, very nice plug and very smoothly done. <laughs> uh, which uh, uh, weather instrument do you have? I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, Tyler got it for me uh, a couple ah, of years ago, and okay. I love it. So right now it's down for maintenance. Uh, I have to replace the little rechargeable batteries in there but uh he has a uh, weather data severe weather data company called allison house that's right haven't heard from him in a while he's out still there. out there yeah he's, he's out there. There. okay good mm-hmm. yeah you know uh the reason i asked uh, my davis outdoor piece uh the uh that has the temperature and humidity and the rainfall and all that has just about died uh and i was getting ready to replace it and i came across a um a uh, Kickstarter for an outfit called Bloom Sky. And I'm um, gotten in on the second iteration of this. It's called Sky 2. And it does everything that um, the Davis do- unit does for less than what I can replace the outside piece for. So I'm going to, uh, I've ordered one. It'll come for Christmas. And one of the nice things about it is one, it hooks into the, um, uh, the uh, weather who are those people? Weather the Weather Underground. Weather Underground. And so you can uh, get placed on the map and people can log in and see it on the internet. But it also has a camera that looks up and it takes a picture every now and then of the sky, which is kind of neat. You know, uh, it's a simple little thing. But it's all solar powered, um, no other connections. And uh, I think I'm going to be real happy with it. So I'm, I'm excited to, uh, for it to get here. Excellent. Yeah. Our next uh, viewer mail is from Steve. Hey, Eric, just watch your video of making zucchini sweet potato fritters, which was kind of a fail, but it was a fun one, and wanted to make a quick comment observation. A few of your videos, you cut in a few shots of street scenes of Brooklyn, like when you're just walking down the street. These are so great. So neat to see street life in New York. Could you add a bit more of that content from time to time? Yes. Not living in a big city before, it's always cool to see life in a big city and especially world-famous Brooklyn. (laughs) <laughs> Anyhow, just a suggestion. Love your vids and really enjoy your podcast. We look forward to each and every one. All the best, Steve. So, yeah, thank you, Steve. Yeah, I've noticed that you've been doing more and more little side videos to include in your uh, your videos, and I've been enjoying those as well. I just, um, there's a part of me that would love to do a daily vlog, kind of like Casey Neistat, and um, I just can't handle that workload. I just, I know I would not be able to pull it off like he does. I think he drinks a lot of coffee, <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, as I do like this, just kind of like, okay, we're going to jump out of the kitchen here and go to the store. And I just bring the camera along and, uh, you know, actually some, there's some people that don't like it, but I'm like, you know, that's, that's, I try and make it more than just a how to, I'd like to make it a little bit of a story maybe, or a little visually interesting. Uh, it's not just a, okay, here's how you take the toilet off, you know? So well, yeah. and it, but it also has to be creative and fun for you to do, not just, um, you know, I mean, it's for the, the viewers and whatnot, but you've been doing this for how long now? How eight many, years. how many, <laughs> yeah, eight years you, and you know, if you don't change it up a little bit, the format and add some things and try some new things, it gets very boring, very fast because it's difficult to, um, edit video well. And uh, you spend a lot of time with your butt in the chair. Yeah, I'm going to edit this afternoon after I go get my deer hunting permit. 
So, which you can buy in Brooklyn, which I find really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> How many deer are there? The, uh, in Brooklyn, there aren't any, thankfully. I, I hear you have a lot of coyotes. There are coyotes coming into the city. Yeah, they. Mm-hmm. Um, well, they're they're like scrawny dogs, so people actually don't know what they are. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And they come over on um, bridges, basically. There's um, there's some rail bridges that connect Brooklyn and Manhattan to the mainland. So we have another um, one from Rick in Oregon. Um, I was talking about trying to hook up my very analog stereo to my iPhone or my iPad or something. Mm -hmm. And he said, Hey Eric, regarding your, regarding your stereo connection issue, I've had good luck with the blue ant line of products. And I have this one and he links to a uh, blue ant headset streamer and i'll link to that in the show notes here this would allow you to stream your phone to your stereo system it connects with a mini plug but you could use an rca adapter if you needed to and i have the rca adapter and then he brings up the uh the echo something else you might want to consider is an amazon echo dot i have several they are great especially when connected to a stereo system they're like a small version of the alexa The bonus is that they connect to the internet and your phone so you can play music from any source. I listen to podcasts, NPR, BBC, etc. through the device, and it's all voice controlled. A lot more capabilities than just a Bluetooth streamer. Pretty cool from Rick in Oregon. And Rick and I actually went on to have an email conversation about my concerns about the internet. And he said, you know, he basically said, yeah, they probably can do that. But he says, my life is pretty boring, <laughs> so why would anyone <laughs> want to? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a good point, you know. So that was really cool. Um, radio at Gardenfort.tv is the email address, so that's always cool. So thanks. Okay. Anything else on the uh, on the reader mail? Uh, not that I have. I'm, I'm in the middle of moving uh, my email to my newer computer, so I lost a couple of things. So if, mm. if I didn't, well, read you're, your email, you're you're also in you're also in the basement right now, trying to get away from the hammering of the uh, the uh, jackhammer upstairs. Yeah. yeah, stuff is kind of com- miscombobulated right now. Ah. Discombobulated, combobulated. That's it. That's the it. other day I had both neighbors hammering away, so it was just oh, that's the time when you go for a walk. <laughs> Take, take the dogs and go downtown. Do some filming in a park. Yeah, the, the pups are great. Um, they're actually asleep right now, so that's the best kind, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever I see them, they're always bothering you for uh, tennis balls, so that's it's good to know they have some downtime, too. Yeah, they're very proactive. I actually was uh, mulching the leaves with the big Troy built uh, mower, mm-hmm. and uh, whenever you bring out the lawnmower, they think it's time to throw the ball. So it's kind of funny that they're scared of the mower, but they want you to throw the ball. So they get kind of close and they kind of, they kind of throw the ball at you while you're mowing. <laughs> mm. You know, I'm, I'm in the process. Uh, we have two new rescues, uh, Darcy and Button. And Darcy is very skittish and Button is extremely loving, but very headstrong. And so we've been doing um, uh, basic obedience training with them the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, since it's gotten a little bit cooler and we can spend more time outside and, and, uh, and working them. And it's, um, it's really amazing what a little bit of hot dog will do for a terrier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden they become very compliant. Hot and, dog uh, works. Yeah. Hot dog works. All right, cool. Well, that probably wraps up the show. We got, uh, the Cubs won the series. So, uh, our, Huzzah. our Chicago fans are quite happy. I bet. Yeah. Sorry, I Cleveland. I know there's a lot of people in Ohio that listen to the show too. So sorry about that. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, when neither team had won in a very long time, it's, you know, you, no one could lose as far as I'm concerned. You know, they both made it into the playoffs and that's great. Yay. Yay. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, again, if you want to support Garden Fork while you're shopping on Amazon, there are links on every Garden Fork page. There's usually an Amazon ad. If you click on the ad, that takes you to Amazon and tells them that you came from us. Or you can use our affiliate link. It's gardenfork.tv slash Amazon. You type that in and you'll be taken to Amazon and told that we sent you. And that's always appreciated. Mm-hmm. And then email us, radio at gardenfork.tv. Anything else, Rick? Well, yeah, don't forget to mention the uh, uh, the Patreon link. I, I have come to really love Patreon. Uh, you can... You subscribe or you you donate on a because monthly basis. A monthly or, or supporter, yeah. 
uh, become a monthly supporter, just a couple of bucks. But what I've done, it, it allows you to consolidate all your, your giving in that way, your, your support, your patronage. Uh, for and for so, different content creators. Yeah, for different content creators. And you can kind of see how much is going out every month. And, you know, at the end of every podcast, people are begging for money and whatnot. And, you know, send us a buck, send us a buck. And it's just so much easier to go to Patreon if they've signed up for it. Uh, you know, go for a couple of bucks a month. Uh, we have a limit here in our budget because we're both retired. And we decide who's going to get what. So far, you've made the cut, my friend. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'll have you on the show again, Rick. <laughs> yeah, but it, it really it really helps uh, on the giving side. And it... it you get to see a lot of wonderful uh, uh, creative material that you would probably never see otherwise. I actually um, post a uh, Patreon only video uh, that gets emailed to all my patrons. Right. Once or twice a month. So I don't know if Rick watches those or not. But. I, I do. Uh, I do. I, occasionally, I, I guess. But, you got enough of Eric already. <laughs> well, I, I just have a lot to do right now. I'm still working on those weddings from two weeks ago. Um, oh, our getting, next show we'll talk about amateur wedding photography and why you should avoid it. Yes. <laughs> this was a labor of love for a friend. I would never do it for anyone else. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cool. Well, I need to get back to uh, moving the mouse on those pictures. I'll talk to you later, my friend. All right. Make it a great day, everyone. We'll see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>